That was very good. So praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, be turned to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. And uh, that was a new item. Okay. So uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about the gift of Christ. I was going to have you stay standing, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, So uh, this morning, I just want you to, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, thank you for coming. If you're a first-time guest, you can grab one from that uh, bag that we gave you. And there's a, there's a, a Bible that we've assembled right here at HBF. One of the things that we do here is assemble the Word of God. And you can be turning to page 944, Isaiah chapter 9. And we're in a series uh, that will conclude next week as we uh, get into Christmas Eve service, which will be a great time next Sunday morning. Uh, and we've been basing it off of Isaiah chapter 9, uh, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. And we're talking about the gift of Christ this morning. Uh, last week we were talking about how a child was born, right? And we, we got into that uh, study. Uh, today we're talking about, and the promise that comes with that, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, unto us a son is given, and the gift that uh, is implied with that gift. And so if you have your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, familiar passage to many of us, it says in verse uh, 6 of Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the word of God. We're thankful for the promise of the prophecies that we talked about last week, and also, Lord, the, the gift that is mentioned here that comes from the birth of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, recording that for us in your word many centuries before Jesus was ever born, and recording all those details that we looked at last week, the promise that uh, you gave. Your word is true, and just as you, will, uh, you promised that you would come at the first coming, and you did right on time, you'll be coming back for us soon. And Lord, we're ready. We're looking forward to that. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that our hearts would be ready as we come to this season of Christmas, that we don't forget Christ in Christmas. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that today, this morning, we can set aside all the distractions of this season that are not focused on glorifying you, uh, the, the, the marketing campaigns, the commercialism, all of those things that are designed to draw us into despair. Uh, Lord, um, and those that are in depression and all kinds of things this season, It's the opposite of really what Christmas should be about. It should be about the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And we're so thankful that Jesus has come to this earth as the angels sang and proclaimed his name and his birth. Lord, we praise you this morning and thank you as it truly was a divine night when our our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born. We pray a blessing this morning on the reading and the hearing of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, the birth of a new child. Uh, What an exciting thing that is. It's an amazing thing. And so this morning uh, in the foyer, right on time, uh, Jan and Hannah come in with baby Yanni. I'm like, wow, there's there's my illustration. And so, uh, and and then Laverne's just had a baby. Uh, And then last week on Wednesday night, I was with uh, uh, Jocelyn out in the foyer, you know, uh, Cody and Taylor's baby girl and and it's just there's something about infants and they're they're just they're just precious you just want to you know get all your nummies in and hug and hug them and all that and get that that baby fix and uh and they're just sweet and uh you know the bible is very clear here that that this text says unto us a child is born right not just given right uh a child is given but a son in particular i should say be more specific unto us a son is given right? So that's obviously a male child. And uh, so today we want to examine this gift, this gift of this male child, the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto us, a son is given. No pregnancy is, you know, an accident. All children are planned by God uh, because the fruit of the womb is his reward in every circumstance. So Jesus, uh, without a doubt, is the most divinely uh, planned pregnancy in human history and all of eternity for that matter. Because he's prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15. I mean, it goes all the way back. And we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to rehearse all of that. But God carried out his prophecy right on time. And of course, that wasn't the only prophecy. Uh, and, and right 
to the minute of his birth in Judah. Jesus came right on time, just as he was prophesied uh, to live. He was also prophesied to die. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, it says that he would be cut off. And again, right on time, he was cut, cut off. His death came so that we could be saved. So this morning, I pray that, that you have received the gift because Jesus came uh, to live a sinless life and die on the cross in our place. So I'm, I'm going to front load this with the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Uh, he, he, is, he is the Son of God, and He lived a sinless life. He was buried. Uh, he died on the cross on our, in our place. He died and was buried and rose the third day. And He's alive right now. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And you can receive Him by calling upon His name. That's the gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. So when Joseph was, was uh, being visited by the angel of the Lord, he told Joseph that the child's name should be Jesus because he's to save his people from his sins. You know, this morning, if you have received the gift of eternal life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, well, then your salvation is secure. But if not, today is the day of salvation. Today is the time. It's the time in human history when your life intersects with the Word of God and you need to be quickened being brought to life through the power of God's Holy Spirit, the invisible person of Christ, quickening your dead soul and bringing you to life. And, and uh, man, that is today, because today is the day of salvation. Jesus' name means salvation. When you go back and look, and you've heard me in weeks prior talk about how Jesus um, is, the, is the Hebrew name of Joshua. And when you go back and look at what Joshua means, it just simply means uh, <clears throat> Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. And of course, Jesus Christ is our salvation. So Joseph was told, Mary was told, this is going to be the name of the child. It is Jesus. In Matthew one twenty one, the Bible says, And she shall bring forth the son, and, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So Jesus was not just a son of Israel, though he obviously is a son of Israel. Historically, in the context of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah is a Hebrew prophet writing to the nation of Israel, and this child is obviously given to Israel. That's why Jesus came to his own, but we know the Bible says his own received him not. He came to the Jews initially, but the Jewish Messiah is our Messiah. He is, and he was, and he is the Son of God. He was a gift given to save Israel and the world from our sins. And this morning, I want to consider the gift that God has given uh, through his son and in his son. So as I've titled the message, it's the gift of Christmas. Our first point of study is very simple. God gave his son to reveal God's divinity. He gave his son to reveal God's divinity. So my thesis is that the son of God, uh, <clears throat> the son that God gave on Christmas morning was the son of God. The son that God gave on Christmas morning was the son of God. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4, there's a question that's posed. It says, Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in his garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Now, we all know the answer to that. And then it goes on to say, What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Now, if you were in the Old Testament during the time of Solomon, you would have said, What's his name? Uh, or Agar, actually. Uh, there was no way Agar could have known. He could have said, well, Jehovah. Well, then what's Jehovah's son's name? Oh, good question. That was not revealed until the angel of the Lord revealed it to, to Joseph and Mary. The, the son of God would be named Jesus. When he read Proverbs 3 and verse 4, he understood that Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the right answer to the question in Proverbs 30 and verse 4. And of course, the New Testament gives us revelation of that New Testament that was given in Jesus' blood. And in Hebrews 1, uh, the Bible says in verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, speaking the Old Testament uh, fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So this Son is not just the creator, uh, not just uh, the Savior, He is the Creator. He goes on to say in verse 3, "...who, being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He is greater than the angels. For, un <clears throat> for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There's not one angel that's been begotten. Uh, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Why? Well, because he's God. Hebrews 1, 7, and the angels say, uh, and the angels, and, un, I'm saying, and of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is, uh, is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. So when Jesus was born, he was, well, he was all God, but he was also all man. He was the gift that God had given to all of us. He was, he was and he is, and he is still the God-man. He was begotten once in all of eternity when he came forth of Mary. He, he uh, was created a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death in the next chapter, in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Yet we see that he was still all God and all man. So the son that was given is the son of God. As we saw last week, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So the first uh, mention of the phrase, Son of God, is uttered by the lost Gentile king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. Imagine that. If you do a word search on the phrase, Son of God, you're going to come up, not in the New Testament context, but the Old Testament context. Daniel 3.25, it says, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Like the Son of God. And so <clears throat> we see this is the only time you see the phrase Son of God in the Old Testament. Nebuchadnezzar obviously understands that this angelic host, uh, that what angelic hosts are, I'm sorry, that Nebuchadnezzar obviously understands what angelic hosts are called, and he spent time with Daniel with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he clearly understood that the man who was with those three servants in the fiery furnace indeed was the Son of God. Not a Son of God. The Son of God. The one that was promised. The angel of the Lord as we see Jesus in his pre-incarnate appearance in the Old Testament. Those are called Christophanies or uh, also called Theophanies or whatever you want, theological term you want to call it. There are times where Jesus shows up in bodily presence in the Old Testament. And so this is an example of that. In the, and when Nebuchadnezzar sees him, he calls him, uh, this looks like he's the son of God. And he was. He was the angel of the Lord, and he was with them in that fiery furnace. And you know what? The Lord is with us. You know, at the end of the gospel there in the, in the book of Matthew, as he's given us our commission, he says, Lo, I will be with you always, even till the end of the world. The rest of the mentions of this phrase, son of God, are found in the New Testament. They're found 47 times in 46 verses in the New Testament. 26 mentions are found in the Gospels. Two in Acts, four times in the Pauline Epistles, 12 mentions in Hebrews and 1 John, with the final mention in Revelation 2 and verse 18. So Satan tempted Jesus to prove that he was the Son of God in a way that the Father had not prescribed so he could steal his authority. You know about Jesus' public ministry. That child that is the Son of God grew to be a man, as James was just talking about. And then, of course, right off the bat, he was tempted in Matthew chapter 4 by that old adversary, that devil, the serpent, Satan. Matthew 4, 3 says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Of course, there's no question that Jesus was the Son of God, and he refused to do that. And he quoted the scripture, said, man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4, 6, and he saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall ha give his angels charge concerning thee in their hands, that they shall bear thee up, lest <clears throat> at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Also, again, correct. 
but that was not the right time. And he said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. And you know how Jesus was tempted, just like as we are, yet without sin, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Yet he is, and he was, and he will always be the Son of God. The high priest conflated uh, uh, the Christ, the Messiah, to be the Son of God in Matthew 26. This is an important passage, and I'll come back to it later when I get to the Son of Man. But I want you to see in Matthew 26 and verse 63, as Jesus is standing before the high priest Caiaphas, he says, But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, which is I'm commanding you by God's name, right? That thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So he conflates being Messiah as being the Son of God. The Son of God. All four Gospels identify Jesus as the Son of God. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God informed Mary that her child was to be born from her womb, was the Son of God. In Luke one thirty five. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Can you imagine how amazing this news would have been to Mary? The fulfillment of prophecy, the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, and Isaiah 9, 6, and the other prophecies concerning the Messiah. Genesis chapter uh, 50 over there, where Shiloh shall come through Judah and through his loins, and the scepter will not depart, right? All of those prophecies that you could go through in the Old Testament, and there are many, were coming to her, and this is going to be the Son of God. Luke revealed that both Adam and Jesus were titled as the sons of God. If you have your Bibles, look over in Luke chapter 3, and uh, I, don't, I didn't put these up on the screen, I don't think. So uh, turn over to Luke chapter 3. The genealogy of Jesus begins here in Luke 3, and, and maybe some of you are familiar with this. <clears throat> it says in Luke 3, if you start in verse 23, it says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, and he was supposed to be the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. So this is Joseph's lineage, and, uh, and here it goes through, and I'm not going to read all of those uh, for time's sake, but if you go through those, you'll see three generations um, um, laid out there. And then it gets to the end down here in verse 38. And it says, um, we'll just start in verse 37, which was the son of uh, Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch. We're backing into Genesis, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malil, uh, Malil, Malil uh, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, Genesis chapter 5, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And so here we see that Adam was, notice was, uh, the son of God, but he fell, and he was corrupted by sin, and he died spiritually in a day, and physically within a millennial day, as he died at 930 years of age. So the first Adam was the son of God, and of course Jesus Christ is called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45. And, it, and it, the Bible says there, and so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam made a quickening spirit. I think you know like Ephesians chapter 2, it says you, uh, that we are quickened together, we're brought to life, right? He is a quickening spirit. We often call Jesus the second Adam, uh, and that's actually accurate sequentially because he's the second Adam, but, but God wants us to understand that he is the last Adam because he is the sinless son of God. So John reveals uh, Jesus is the son of God as well. He's in Matthew, he's in Mark, he's in Luke, he's in John. No man has seen God at any time, only the only begotten, which is of the, the, in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. He is Jesus Christ, and he declares the Father. No man's seen God. If you've seen God, you've seen Jesus. That's what Jesus told his disciples. You remember when uh, Thomas is like, hey, show us the Father. And he's like, well, how, how long have you been with me? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, uh, and you know, their minds are blown. The, <clears throat> John the Baptist declared Jesus was the Son of God in John chapter 1, right out of the gate. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. I think you're getting the message. Jesus is the Son that's spoken of in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. He is the Son of God. In John 3, 16, a very familiar passage to most of us. 
Notice what it says, though. Once again, look at it with fresh eyeballs. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because we're of that first Adam. We're corrupt. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God only has one begotten Son, and that is Jesus Christ. And our gospel that we preach, that famous passage in John 3, 16, if we keep going to verse 18, leads us right to Jesus Christ and his title as Son of God. God, the only begotten Son of God. In John chapter 20 and verse 30, the Bible says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus Christ is that Jesus is the Christ, right? The Messiah, the Son of God. You can't divorce him from his from his standing as the Son of God. He is Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that believing, you might have life through his name. There's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It's under his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ, right, Jesus Messiah, is the Son of God. I believe that he is God manifest in the flesh. Right? It's not Reverend Sun Young Moon. That's not the Messiah. Right? It's not Muhammad. It's not anyone else. It's not Confucius. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, and he was, and he will always be the Son of God. And so in 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And that's why it's so important to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God hath raised him. Who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Messiah, is, Jesus, is the Son of God. And so you're not saved if you don't believe and confess that the Son of God gave uh, his life on the cross to take away the sin of the world. So why do I spend so much time on that? That's our first point of study. Well, see, the gift of Christmas is about God giving his Son to reveal God's divinity. It's his deity. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But secondly, God gave his Son to establish God's authority. God gave his Son to establish God's authority. Uh, the Son of God gave on uh, the Son. I'm sorry. The Son God gave on Christmas morning was the Son of David. Now this ties us a little closer to Isaiah chapter nine in, in historical context. The phrase "Son of David" in the Old Test uh, in the Old Testament um, <clears throat> is found uh, ten times, uh, and all ten of these reference the biological sons of David. Uh, just like Joseph would have been considered a son of David because he biologically was from the line of David. So the phrase son of David in the New Testament, however, is, 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 an, is a whole different story. The phrase son of David is found 16 times in the New Testament. And all mentions are found in the, gospel of Math, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John is conspicuously absent and omitting calling Jesus the son of David. Because John reveals Jesus as what? Son of God, right? It's about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of the four Gospels, if you're new to studying your Bible, each one of the Gospels looks at Jesus in a different light. Matthew sees him as the king. Mark sees him as the servant. That's why there's no lineage in Mark, because he's like a slave. In Luke, he's the son of man. Luke writes very, uh, very uh, detailed notes on his crucifixion and, and, his, uh, and his humanity. And then you get to John... And again, there's, uh, it's just about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. So it deals with Jesus as God. So you get four different uh, perspectives on who Jesus Christ is. In this case, this, uh, Jesus being the son of David is not even mentioned in the book of John uh, because that book is not dealing with his human lineage. It's dealing with the fact that he was divine. But you do see him mentioned as the son of David. Uh, Matthew mentions Jesus as the son of David nine times. Why? It's a good question. You're asking good questions. Because Matthew reveals Jesus as the king, and therefore heir to the throne of David. He is the king. In Matthew 1.20, the angel of the Lord addressed Joseph as the son of David, because he was the son of David biologically. 
And he is, and he was, and he will be the king, right? The king of kings and the Lord of lords. That ties into even current events, what's going on in the Middle East to this day, in the promised land, and, and, and a few years ago when they moved the, the capital from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. What is all that about? Well, that's all about this man Jesus who was born of Mary, uh, the son of God, also the son of David, and his, human, his humanness comes from David's line through Mary, uh, his humanity is an heir, and, and he, he will take upon himself the, the government, as we'll get to in chapter 7, and the increase will be no end. Where's that going to happen? It's going to happen from Jerusalem. That's why when they moved the capital and acknowledged what the Bible already has been telling us, uh, you know, from antiquity, that this is where Jesus is going to rule and reign, is in Jerusalem. And so now uh, that is the capital. Of course, it's always been the capital, but it's been recognized as of a couple years ago. Well, it's more than that now, but however many years ago that was. So as Jesus' triumphed, uh, triumphal entry <clears throat> was under, uh, when, as Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was underway, the people cried out, Hosanna to the son of David, because they were receiving Jesus as king, hoping he would throw off the influence of Rome. Matthew 21, 9 says, And the multitudes that went before and, the, and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They were praising his name. Why? Because they saw him at least as the son of David, right? This, this, the Messiah was coming in the context is that we're going to get rid of these Romans. Get this occupation off of us and we're going to have our own king. And of course, uh, Jesus came to die for their sins first and they missed that part. But the throne of Israel was attributed to the son of David. And, and I think last week I went through and gave you some references to, to that prophecy and the promises of the throne of David. I won't go back and rehash that. But if you recollect what I was talking about, it's interesting that Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 says, The book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ being the son of David is the fulfillment of that prophecy that was given to David in the Old Testament. Here comes the one that's going to rule on his throne forever. The, uh, Matthew's lineage, lineage goes through the genealogy of Joseph. And the blind, men, uh, the blind men of Matthew 29 could see what the Jewish leaders could not, that Jesus was heir to the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 29, the Bible, said, the Bible says in uh, chapter 20 and verse 29, And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. They understood who they were dealing with. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 38, as Israel was in blindness, these blind men could see that Jesus was the son of David. Luke 18, 38. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. O son of David, have mercy on me. The chief priests and the scribes were displeased to consider the son of David has given... <coughs> um, and was given the heir to the, to the kingdom that they wanted. They were not about to submit to Jesus Christ as king, not even an earthly king. In Matthew chapter 21, it says in verse 15, and, and when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. When people said, Hosanna to the son of David, it, it gave them grief. It's sort of like today. You can talk about baby Jesus, right? We can mock him in, in movies and Hollywood. But when you talk about this child growing up to be the son of David, about giving a nation an inheritance, let alone being the way and the truth and the life, salvation to the world through a man named Christ Jesus, well, all of a sudden people start getting a little bit anxious. Because now you're talking about power, you're talking about influence, you're talking about geopolitical activity on this planet, and there's other people that think that they have control. And they only have control because God's allowed it, Romans 13. 
They were sore displeased to hear that people would proclaim that this man, Jesus, was the son of David because they knew what that meant. They were following him. They would submit to him. They would, he was the, the heir. He was the rightful heir to the throne. And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? They're saying, Jesus, you better stop the mouths of these people from giving you praise. That's blasphemous. He says, wait a minute. And he quotes scripture to him and says, no, it's not blasphemous. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 2, he takes the opportunity uh, to, to the Jews' displeasure to point out that they're fulfilling more prophecy concerning him <laughs> as the Messiah, the Son of God, in this case, the Son of David. Though Jesus <clears throat> was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, he still retained authority as the King of the Jews, again, as they mocked him on that cross. This world's got to, they're going to wake up one day and realize that Jesus Christ is not just a baby in a manger, but he truly is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we think about this child, it's a big deal to say he's the son of God. He is the son of David. Many of the Jews were more excited about the son of David, though, than they were the son of God. Many Jews like Peter and Thomas could not wait to see Jesus exert his authority as the son of David. And that's why Peter took up arms against the Roman centurion. That's, that's why Jesus had to put his ear back on, right? Because Peter was ready to go, man. He was ready for a physical fight, a physical confrontation. And man, I tell you, the sad thing today, a lot of Christians are getting like that too. They're getting their, they're getting their kingdoms messed up. As we're getting closer, certainly, to see the, the kingdom of heaven prophecies come to fruition, our, our job as the church is to continue to get the, the word out that there is a Savior, there's a living Savior. He's in the world today, right? We know him, no matter what men may say. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of David. He is our Lord, and he's our Savior. But man, Thomas and, and, uh, and uh, Peter, they just wanted to get those Romans out. Isn't it interesting, though? Paul or uh, Jesus found a special affection for a lot of those Roman soldiers, didn't he? Why? Because they had to serve under the same rotten authority that the Jews were under. It was very oppressive, as in the days, right? <clears throat> so before Jesus can heal your land, listen, he's got to heal your hearts. It would have done no good to be the king. He'd have had to execute everybody. <laughs> so he's got to come first to deal with the heart of man and deal with the sin of man so that he can redeem them and deal with the hearts before he could heal their land. To some, the thought of Jesus's authority, even this morning, terrifies you, as it terrified me many years ago when I finally woke up out of my, my, uh, my, my dream uh, that I called life and realized that, wait a minute, <clears throat> this man Jesus is God, that this man Jesus rose again from the dead. This man Jesus is who he said he is. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. This man, Jesus, is the subject of revelation. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy that's already been written. I've been given enough information to comprehend this. That means, therefore, if I don't receive him, where am I? I'm in the crosshairs of his wrath. And I have to submit to his authority, else I'm bucking it to my own demise, my own condemnation, to, to, to face the wrath of God without any advocate, without any propitiation for my sin, with no high priest to cover me. God forbid that's you this morning. We talk about Jesus Christ being the Son of God. What we're talking about is he is the authority. Though he came as a child, though he made himself lower than the angels for the suffering of death, he is still God manifest in the flesh. He is still the one that will fulfill all the prophecies that were written. The prospect that the young Messiah was born in Bethlehem caused Herod to commit genocide because of his fear. I heard this morning Pastor Steve talking about two things that motivate people, fear and love. And God comes full of love for this world, and man comes, principalities come full of fear that they're going to lose their power, clutching to the last hope that they can stay in charge. Herod, I'm sure, busted hell wide open when he took his last breath. 
Today, if I could talk to Herod, he'd be telling everybody, he'd be telling me, he'd say, Brian, preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Don't send anybody here. Matthew 2, 16, then Herod, when he saw that, that he was mocked of the wise men, you know, long before New York, there were wise men, wise guys, right? These guys come from the Middle East, and they were exceedingly wise as they realized because God tipped them off. Don't go back to Herod because his intentions are not pure. He got mad. He was exceedingly wroth, and he sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which uh, he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Beloved, that's as wicked as some of the stuff going on over there today. It's notable. It's notable for its wickedness and its debauchery. It's terrible. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken of Jeremy, being Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. And of course, subsequently, that child Jesus was taken by Joseph because he was tipped off as well and, and went down into Egypt for a season to escape that persecution. This morning, what, if anything, is keeping you from submitting to Jesus' royal authority? Are you afraid to lose control like the religious leaders of Israel's day? Maybe you're concerned about your own authority, like Herod, that maybe you'll lose some sort of influence, some sort of power, maybe control of your own decisions. I remember when I first got saved, some people would say, well, Brian, it's good that you made that decision, but don't go too far. I'm like, too late. I drank the Kool-Aid, man. I'm all in. That's the only way I know to go is too far. Man, how many of you go to, I remember I had a friend of mine, I won't say his name because he's, some of you know him, but I had a friend of mine. And man, this guy would study back in the day. We we're in shepherd school, and he'd study and study and study. And I'd, t- I'd get his notes because he did better notes than, than anybody. I mean, he was like a transcript machine, amazing, with extra notes on top of it. And I told this brother, I said, Man, brother, I said, I appreciate your notes. I appreciate all you're doing. But I said, You need to slow this thing down because, like, this guy was, he was just, he was just crazy, like, z- exceedingly zealous. Everything that was said in shepherd school, man, he was typing it out, studying it out, real time in it. I mean, just digging in and going deeper. And if you've been in like our institute, it's a lot. It's a lot. And to do that is like amazing. And this guy's a pretty brilliant guy anyway. He's a programmer and all of this, that, and the other. He's a pretty sharp dude. But what he told me was this. He said, hey, Brian, listen, when I was in the world, I'd take drugs and I'd stay up for days. Burning myself out for the devil. He goes, now that I'm in Christ, I'm burning myself out for Jesus. Man, I never forgot that. I thought, what a, what a dude, man. Some of y'all are focused. You're meant to be wired. You're meant to be going all in. And if you're going to go all in, go all in for Jesus. I'm telling you, it's the only way to get a good ROI. It's the only way to get a good return on your investment. I mean, you can waste your life doing drugs or waste your life on a lot of other things that will occupy and waste all your time. At the end of the day, you'll come back with nothing. Even if you gain the whole world, you'll lose your soul. But man, put yourself in, all in for Jesus, and see what comes from it. Oh, it's amazing. What are you worried about losing? You're not going to have anything if you don't lose your own life and exchange it for Christ. Man, it's a gift exchange. Man, he gave his son for you, and you give up your heart for him. And you go all in. The gift of Christmas. God gave his son to reveal God's divinity. God gave his son to establish God's authority. And lastly, God gave his son to address the depravity of humanity. God gave his son to address the depravity of humanity. I could do a whole message just on this one point. The son, of, the son God gave on Christmas morning was the son of man. He was the son of man. The son of man. The title Son of Man is mentioned 89 times in the New Testament. 88 of the 89 mentions refer to Jesus' incarnation. Hebrews 2.6 is the exception. Paul, interestingly enough, never addressed Jesus as the Son of Man in his writings, other than Hebrews 2, if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, as I do. So there's only four mentions of the phrase Son of Man outside the Gospels. In Acts 7.53, Stephen identifies Jesus as the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. In Revelation 1.13, 
in Revelation 14, 14. They also refer to Jesus as the Son of Man. So the bulk of your references for Jesus as the Son of Man are found then in the Gospels, in the New Testament. And Son of Man was Jesus' favorite title for himself during his earthly ministry. And you might be asking, well, Brian, why is that? And I'm going to say, well, that's a good question. Let's find out. Because he, he used the title because it is exclusively set aside for himself in the Gospels. It was not used to speak of another man or an angel or even of Israel, as we've seen the Son of God can be kind of likened to Israel, or eventually we are also, First John chapter 3, sons of God. This title, Son of Man, refers to Jesus exclusively in the Gospels. Although it does have a sense in which it could be any man, in the Bible it's only referring to Jesus as the Son of Man, other than the, that passage in Hebrews chapter 2. And so in the book of John, Jesus uttered this uh, title of himself 10 of 12 times to the, to, uh, 10 of, 10 of the 12 times that the phrase was mentioned. And when Jesus isn't proclaiming himself to be the Son of Man, it's used in, the, in a question, in a deriding question about Jesus and Christ being the Son of Man in John chapter 12 and verse 34. It says, the people answered him, we have heard of the law that, <clears throat> we have heard out of the law, I should say rather, that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And they're asking that question. Of course, he is, and he calls himself the Son of Man over and over and over. It's what he titles himself as, the Son of Man. He used this title because it was a fulfillment. And this is the deeper meaning, and that's why it took a moment to get there. It's a deeper meaning of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 through 14, which revealed that he is an exalted Lord and Savior. We say that phrase all the time. He's Lord and Savior. You know, it's just kind of commonplace to us. But in the Scripture, in the Old Testament, in Daniel chapter 7, in that prophecy book of Daniel, there's this prophecy written in verse 13 of chapter 7. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and, and that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Notice in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, it's a, that's a proper pronoun, right? It's a title, capital S O N of man, capital S. It's a title. This is a, a unique, unique situation in the Old Testament. The phrase Son of Man is used, but it's not always used in relation to the Messiah. And this is very clearly a reference to Jesus the Messiah. It's also a future prophecy of what's going to be happening and is recorded in Revelation in regard to how God is releasing Jesus to, to um, open up the seals and, and reclaim his planet, Earth. But I'm not going to get into that this morning too far. My point is simply this. This title, Son of Man refers to the dominion that Jesus has and will have over this world. Jesus was careful to correlate the two titles of Son of Man and Son of God. As a matter of fact, as I was studying this out, I, before I got to this, uh, this particular aspect of looking at the Son of Man, I didn't know this, so this is new to me, that I was wondering, I was like, why did Jesus answer this way? And then God revealed it to me, so I appreciate that, Holy Ghost. So in, Dan, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 63, the Bible says, But Jesus held his peace. Again, we've already seen this passage, right? They're asking him, who, who are you, right? Um, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God, right? We've covered that. And Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven, now, Jesus held that. He'd been going around telling everybody, if you go back and look through the Gospels, he's telling everybody, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man. And of course, anyone who believed that he was Messiah understood that he meant, I'm the Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. But anybody that wanted to give him grief, he'd just say, well, he's the Son of Man. I mean, we're all sons of men, and you can actually use it in that context as well. But right on time, as Jesus is standing before the high priest, this little baby that was born, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Man, comes forth. And right on time, as, as, as Caiaphas asked him, are you the Son of God? He says, oh, 
Am I the son of God? Well, I'm the, I've been telling you I'm the son of man. And he quotes from Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13. I'm the authority here. And look what happens. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. He knew exactly what Jesus was saying. What further need have, have we of witnesses? We've heard it from his own mouth. He has said that he is the Son of Man. He is the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. This man is a blasphemous. What thank ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. <clears throat> right on time, Jesus says, Yep. It's time to die because that's why I was born. And all he had to do to get to that place is just reveal who he was. The son of God, the son of David, and yes, the son of man. Fulfilling Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. <clears throat> Jesus left no doubt that he was the Christ, the son of man prophesied in Daniel 7. It would assure him that he'd be found guilty of blasphemy and fulfill that call that he had so many years ago, three years earlier. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus used this title because it allowed him to fulfill his ministry as he revealed himself as the Son of Man during his public ministry. As I've already mentioned, the Son of Man could refer to any human born of man, but, but we are all humans born of men, of course. The Old Testament has several references to the son of man uh, or son of men being born of men, and just like the, the passage in Hebrews 2 and verse 9. So the first mention of that phrase in the context is actually dealing with fallen men. In Numbers chapter 23, it says, God is not a man that he should die or lie neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Isn't that interesting? He, he's, it's, it, the first mention of it is like, well, Jesus said, uh, God is not like, like us. He's not like a man that he's going to lie and have to repent. He keeps his word. That makes him unique among the sons of men. There's only one man like that. That's him. Revelation tells us that his spirit that God has given him is the spirit of prophecy. When he says something, he will fulfill it. <clears throat> his word is, he says, true. Right? His word is true. That's why we have the words of God. Even the passage in Daniel chapter 7 in some Bibles has been polluted. I was looking it up in, uh, I think it's the Net Bible. It's all messed up. He's not the son of man. He's a son of man, small s. Take away his deity. The capital S always in indicates <clears throat> that he is the Son of Man, the proper noun. He's the title of the Son of Man. In a real sense, he is offering himself not only as Messiah, but also as, well, the perfect man, the last Adam. The third thing we need to consider is that Jesus used this title because he was identifying with men to save us, even though he was God. We just covered this point in uh, HBI a few weeks ago in our dispensations class. When Jesus offered himself in Matthew 3.15 to be baptized, right? He, John the Baptist proclaims, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus rolls up and says, hey, yeah, John, get me in line here. I'm ready to go. And John's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not worthy to, 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 un, to, to unlatch your shoes. What are you talking about? Get baptized. He says, hey, allow it to be so. Right? Suffered to be so, for it fulfilled all righteousness. Well, Jesus didn't need to fulfill, I mean, Jesus didn't need to repent. We already saw he's not a man that he should repent. Yet he is a man, and he is identifying with who? Israel. And their need to repent. Why? Why do you do that? Well, the same reason you get baptized, you identify with Christ. Christ was identifying with us. He's the son of man. I had a cool chart I made in PowerPoint with a cross and all this stuff, and I threw it out. I still need to study on that a little more. It was pretty neat. But anyway, he was identifying himself as, as, as all God, yet all man. 
He was identifying with common men because he was a human, slated to die a cruel death in our place. In essence, he was identifying with Adam's sinful race through John's baptism, though he was obviously identifying with Israel in that baptism. He identified as a Jew who needed to repent and prepare for his coming. He was identifying as the Lamb of God, the Son of Man, who would restore Adam's lost race. You see, the gift of Christmas, God gave his son to reveal God's deity, the son of God. God gave his son to establish his authority, the son of David. And God gave his son to address the depravity of humanity, the son of man. Unto us, unto us, a son is given. Unto us, a son is given. God gave his son, and he was the son of David, the son of God, the son of man. He was the son of who, pre- <clears throat> who was presented with gold, with frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because it represents his deity as the son of God. Frankincense because it represents his authority as the son of David. And myrrh because it represents the, anoint- uh, the, uh, the anoint- anointing and the al- uh, analgesic uh, properties that Jesus would ha- have, uh, to have to have as a human enduring his earthly ministry and dying on the cross in our place as the son of man. Beloved, this Christmas, we, we are all called to set aside all the commercialism, all the silliness, and focus on Jesus Christ. There are more people right now that are they're, they're, they're scared. They're concerned. They, they want to, they, it isn't like it used to be. Things are changing. A lot of uncertainty. In the middle of a Christmas holiday, they're putting out movies to scare you about the end times. Doomsday scenarios. Why? Because they want you to be scared. But you know what? God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Beloved Jesus Christ, he's the gift. He's the gift this Christmas. He's the gift that God gave. And this morning, if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he's the gift you need. You need him today. Because today is the day of salvation. Let's stand together in an attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity just to consider this son that's been given not only to us, but for us. This son was given on a cross for our sins. He became our sacrifice. He became our propitiation. He is, as First John speaks, the son of God. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for him being our high priest. We're so thankful for him uh, being our advocate. We're so thankful for him being our propitiation. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Lord, you, you don't call all of us this morning to, to reflect on that. If you're here this morning and you've never received the gift of eternal life, man, don't wait. Today, what a great way to celebrate Christmas as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Maybe you've come in this morning and you don't know him as Lord and Savior. God wants you to meet him in a personal way today. Is there anybody that would say, Brian, that is me. I don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to know him. Anybody in my left, in the middle, to my right? I know it's like freaky maybe, you're scared, but if that's you and you know you need to be saved, you know you need to trust Jesus today, just raise your hand in the air. I can't pray you into heaven, but I can pray for you. Is there anybody at all? Maybe you're watching online, and maybe you've never really fully grasped it. The Bible is true. What it says about Jesus is true. Man, do not delay. Today is the day to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Acknowledge that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross in your place, personally, for your sin. And believe what the Bible teaches, that he rose again the third day. He's alive right now, and the Holy Spirit of God is calling all men, including you, to repent. Change your heart and mind and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Call upon his name, the Bible says, and you will be saved. If you mean that with a sincerity, not by works of righteousness that you've done, but putting your faith in his finished work 2,000 years ago on the cross, he will literally come into you and give you new life, eternal life, and it will change your life forever, for eternity. How many of you this morning can say hallelujah to you? I have received that gift. Amen. Amen. With all the stressors of life, with the loneliness, with the the depression, with all the things that go around, even among the church body, praise God this morning, we have the gift, the gift of eternal life. With all the pressures of the holiday weighing you down, man, praise God.
that we're not tied to crass commercialism, but we have Christ, the real essence, the real meaning of the season. Maybe this morning, when you really boil it down, it's time to just let go of some things. You know, those, those Pharisees, they kept holding on to stuff they didn't need to hold on to. They needed to let go and let God have control of his kingdom. Maybe this Christmas, you're wrestling with God over your kingdom, and you need to let God have it so that he can be the Lord of your life and take your life whichever way it needs to go. Maybe he needs to take you into to some area of obedience like baptism or discipleship or some area of ministry. Maybe God's calling someone to lay their life down as a missionary or get, go to HBI, really go all in, as I was talking about this morning, going all in for Jesus. And what a great gift to give God this morning is the very thing that he's given you, which is you. If you're saved this morning, he saved your soul. He saved your life. But he wants us to offer our lives back willingly. Are we holding out on him? Let's not do that. As we close, is there any saints that say, Brian, I just need some prayer? Amen. Me too. Let's pray for one another. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be here this morning and consider these things as we, as we uh, pray uh, right now for the saints that uh, requested prayer, Lord. Uh, I pray, God, that you just continue to give uh, each and every one of your saints the, the truth they need, the, the Spirit of God to teach them all things whatsoever you've said to them, the Word of God uh, to help them understand that, that uh, Lord, your promises, as we talked about last week, will come to pass. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you'd fill us full of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that we would let go of our kingdom and allow you to reign supreme in each and every one of our hearts. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come before you and acknowledge our need, we remember that when the nation of Israel was in need, whether it was in the book of Exodus or in the time of Jesus' first coming, Lord, you were there. You'll be there again in the future in the coming tribulation. But today you're in us of a truth. We are the hope. We are the light of this world. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for filling us with hope during a season that uh, so many are hopeless. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you would fill your saints with your word, that we would go out of here with the gospel on our lips, that we'd be ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ, even today. Because, Lord, we understand that you are the authority. You are the son that was given for us. We thank you and we praise you for making us sons of God. Lord, the world doesn't understand that. They don't understand, but there's a day coming when you appear. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that it'll be evident that indeed we are the sons of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and, change, and praise you for changing us on the inside today, and eventually you'll change us on the outside. We look forward to your promises coming through, and we're thankful uh, for the real meaning of Christmas, which is Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Man. We thank you and we praise you, and we ask a blessing on the reading and the hearing and the living of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thank you for coming this morning. It's good to see you and uh, be a part of all that's going on. The festivities for the holiday season are obviously underway. As you go out and participate in the bake sale, enjoy that. We're going to ask a blessing as we take up the offering and prepare to dismiss. We have a couple other items that you don't want to miss, uh, so don't just run out too quick. Uh, but we're going to prepare to pray over the offering. So I'm going to pray, and then uh, Luke's going to come and give a few announcements. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you. It's a great joy and blessing. As we talk about uh, just uh, putting ourselves in the offering plate, Lord, we want to give her the first fruits of the increase. Uh, that principle of tithing is uh, pre-law and sets a great place to start. So, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. We pray for the offering this week. Pray for our hearts as we set aside uh, finances for the, the uh, Christmas offering as well. We love you. We thank you. We pray a blessing to the reading and the hearing of your word and the giving of gifts to you. We pray, God, you'd multiply it and use it for your honor and glory and the kingdom's sake. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got just a, whoa, sorry. We've got just a couple of announcements this morning before we get out of here. Uh, as Brian mentioned, next Sunday morning, uh, we will have um, our Christmas offering for our missionaries. So that will be, we'll take that up. It's available online now if you wanted to give to that prior to then, uh, or next Sunday we'll be taking that up uh, at the end of service. Also next Sunday, there is no nine o'clock Bible hour. Uh, so we're just having one combined service here at 1030. Uh, there's also no candlelight service um, this year. Uh, we'll be starting that back up again next year. So next Sunday is just one service at 1030, no evening service or anything then. 
Um, also, as Brian mentioned, the bake sale, it is set up out there and ready to go. So hopefully everyone brought some um, appetites for some sweet goodies. Uh, they're taking cards and cash or whatever you would like to pay for that. That again is going for the lighting on the playground equipment. Uh, so they're trying to get some lights out there so we can play later on into the fall as it starts to get dark uh, a little earlier. So um, they're doing that. And then the last thing, I stood right here last week and I told everyone that we have directories available and uh, many of you have been waiting on that for a while. And as soon as I got down from here, someone said, all the directories are gone out there on the connections counter. And so uh, we had them and we've restocked them. There's more available now. So as I'm saying this, I'm fairly confident there is enough directories. If you wanna grab one on your way out, they are available. Uh, on the connections counter. So uh, I apologize if you tried to grab one last week after I told you you could, and they weren't, but they are there now. And uh, once those run out, we'll print some more and we'll restock them. So uh, take those if you haven't gotten one. And then if you have giving envelopes uh, on the table, uh, on, the, on my right, your left, um, as you walk out the door, if you want giving envelopes, uh, we have those printed as well. So make sure and look to grab those um, if you have not done that already. So with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it back off to Brian. We got one more order of business. Thanks. And uh, if you don't find yourself in these, uh, just remember that every uh, second Sunday uh, when we do baptisms is a great time. The, the uh, ladies have it, have it all set up so you can take your pictures. So if you're like, man, I didn't get in there, you will get rotated in as you get your pictures taken if somehow you miss that. So this is our new, uh, new member presentation. I want to invite these that are coming in. We have Julie Nelson. Is Julie in the house? I don't know if I saw her today. Julie Nelson. Julie Nelson, going once, going twice. Okay, Alexis Neely, is Alexis here this morning? I didn't, there she is. Alexis, come on up. And um, uh, Alexis was baptized last week. It's good to have her in the house. Yeah, give her some love. <laughs> Alexis, this is your, uh, there's a baptism certificate. There's a Bible. Uh, I think there's a directory. There's all kinds of goodies in there for you. So if you can stand here for just a moment. All right, don't freak out. It's all good. And then we're going to, and then I need to have Annette Jackson. Is Annette, there's Annette, if uh, she could make her way up. If all these are coming in by, uh, well, Julie is coming by statement of faith. Alexis obviously was baptized, and Annette Jackson is coming in by statement of faith. I think you formerly have been in for a while, but uh, this is a good opportunity to publicly let everyone see Annette. So it's good to have you, Annette, formally and officially. And uh, um, if you're in favor of these being members of HBF, just say a hearty amen. 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 Awesome. So that's great. Woo. Oh, I got, this is a new caveat. So this is your direct, do you have one of these yet? I got one. Okay. All right. Well, then so much for that. But anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, let's, ha let's all stand together. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Make sure you drop by here and see Alexis and Annette and uh, thank them for being members of HBF. And, uh, and uh, we have a great day as you are dismissed. Enjoy Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that are joining HBF officially, formally. Lord, uh, as they're identifying with you, uh, Lord, in your local church, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for Alexis's uh, new uh, walk with Jesus, Lord. We just pray, God, you protect her and keep her and grow her in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just thank you for Annette. And she's also growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just pray, Lord, a blessing upon these as well as Julie uh, Nelson as they come in as members of HBF. Lord, we pray God a blessing on your church today. Thank you for all the things that are going on, all the activities that are going on. We pray in all of these things that you get the honor and the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.